I will let everybody in now as well. Lovely. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you all this evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this evening, we have Jessica White in conversation with Jacqueline Kent discussing Jacqueline's new book, um, Vida, A Woman for Our Time. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently uh, zooming to you from, the Yagara and Turbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I begin this evening, I just want to quickly reiterate some of the information that I um, sent to you with your email to um, join tonight's event. So you've all automatically been placed on mute, but that doesn't mean that we won't be having a Q&A session. It will just look a tiny bit different to how you might expect. So um, you can use the chat box to communicate with me directly. All of your messages will come straight through to me and, um, and your questions, and I'll read them out towards the end of the event um, when I'm prompted to do so by Jess and Jacqueline. So if you want to start sending those through to me as early as possible, that would be fantastic. And if you can't find it, then it's just to the lower left of your screen. Um, it's a little button that looks like a, a chat box, a messenger box. So send me, um, send me your questions there and I'll read them out towards the end of the event. And the last thing that I'd like to mention before I introduce our speakers tonight is that at the moment for event attendees, we've got a special discount on. And that is if you use the code EVENT, E-V-E-N-T, um, on our website, then you'll receive 10% off at checkout. And that's off your order site-wide. So um, I recommend that you get um, in and make the most of that offer while we have it available. I'll be posting um, the link to purchase your copy of VIDA in the chat box soon. So hopefully that will make it pop up if you're still struggling to find it. Um, and so now it's my pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Kent. Jacqueline was born in Sydney and grew up there and in Adelaide. Originally trained as a journalist and broadcaster, she has also been a book editor and a reviewer for numerous publications and has a doctorate of creative arts from the University of Technology, Sydney. As well as biography and general social history, she has written fiction for young adults. A Certain Style, Beatrice Davis, A Literary Life, won the 2002 National Biography Award and the Nita B. Kibble Award. An Exacting Heart, the story of Z Ziba Menuhin, sorry for my awful <laughs> pronunciation there, won the 2009 Need to Be Kibble Award. Beyond Words, A Year with Kenneth Cook, was published to acclaim in 2019. She lives in Sydney. And in conversation with Jacqueline tonight, we have the wonderful Jessica White. Jessica is the author of A Curious Intimacy, for which she was named a Sydney Morning Herald Best Young Novelist. The novel was shortlisted for the Dobby Prize and the Western Australia Premier's Awards and longlisted for the International IMPAC Award. Her second novel, Entitlement, was published in 2012. Jessica's short stories, essays and poems have appeared widely in Australian and international literary journals and have been shortlisted or longlisted for prizes such as the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, the Calibre Prize, the Elizabeth Jolly Prize and the Peter Blasey Award for life writing. Jessica is the recipient of funding from Arts Queensland and the, Arts, and the Australia Council for the Arts and has undertaken residencies at the BR Rat Whiting Studio in Rome and at Ridgeline Pottery near Hobart. Her most recent novel, Hearing Maud, was published in 2019 and recently won the 2020 Michael Crouch Award at the National Biography Awards for a debut work of biography. Jessica is currently writing an eco-biography of Western Australia's first female scientist, 19th century botanist Georgiana Malloy. So Jessica and Jacqueline, it is now my pleasure to hand over to you both for tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, Emma Kate and thanks Jacqueline for coming along and um, being in conversation with me. Um, I was saying um, in a chat earlier that I um, went to Jacqueline's last launch which was on the deck of Avid Reader and it was about her previous book A Year with Kenneth Cook and it was a beautiful launch it was very balmy outside and the crickets were chirping so I'm hoping everyone just imagines they're on the deck of Avid Reader again 
And it's really lovely to be speaking as a debut biographer to be speaking to an established biographer. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. So you've published this fantastic book. You see here, Vida. Sorry, Vida. Get the pronunciation <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, a Woman of Our Time, subtitle. And it's about the remarkable Vida Goldstein, who was the first woman in the Western world to stand for national parliament. And that was in 1903. And she worked tirelessly for suffrage for women and also um, to, to better women's position in society, their social and economic circumstances. And I thought it was written in a really engaging way, like it's stuffed full with facts, but it still moves along at a really fast clip um, and the facts don't get in the way of the story. Um, and the thing um, I really enjoyed about it was um, learning new things and also you show just how much work was involved in trying to raise awareness for women's rights. Like it took years and years. So what drew you to Vida in the what? first instance? In the first place? Well, yeah. it's, it sort of goes back a fair way actually okay. because I had a friend to whom actually the book's dedicated, Diane Takahashi, yeah. who was working at Sydney University ages and ages ago and she did um, history degree and her uh, major thesis was about Australian suffragettes and I thought oh I didn't know there were any I'd never heard of any and then Vida's name for reasons that you will appreciate came up quite quickly when we discussed this and I thought well, why don't we know about this woman? And so Diane and I wrote a radio feature, which we put on ABC radio. And that would have been about 1980. Oh. And I've just had a name in the back of my head ever since. And so three year, when three years ago, I was looking for a project, I thought, what about Vida? And I looked, and there is actually um, an academic biography of her, but there's surprisingly, surprising lack of material. I mean, we're getting better now, but we are really not very good at memorialising or celebrating our women pioneers, and certainly Vida came into that category. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And... Um... With, what, what was it about her that drew her to you? Because for her to stay in your head for about 30 years, she must have had some kind of presence. Oh, look, I'll tell you, she had, the, she had a very good... This is something that is not normally associated with um, women activists. You know, it's all a bit sort of earnest and doing the right thing and maybe having to smash windows if you have to, if you're in England, that is. But uh, what got me with her really was her sense of humour. She had a brilliant sense of humour. And I'd just like to illustrate it with one, one story, which was, you're probably all aware that, that there were two bites at the um, women getting the vote. Cherry, if I can put it that way. There was the state vote, and then there was the federal vote. And the federal vote was passed in 1902, and women were eligible to stand for parliament in 1903. But in Victoria, the state of Victoria, which had the first kind of look at that, um, women did not get the vote till 1908, the state vote. Now, fast forward or fast back really to Vida in a photographic studio in 1908 with the Premier of Victoria, who was absolutely recalcitrant and did not want women to have the vote. And Vida came up to him in the studio and they, they were both having their photographs taken for various reasons. And so this being 1908, they were there for a while. Um, she went up to him and she said, all right, okay, Premier Bent, because that was his name. Why don't you, you know, why aren't you going to pass a bill? Why didn't you let it go through the Legislative Assembly? And he said, oh, well, look, I really would, but there's somebody in, in my party who really has to be persuaded and I'm a bit nervous about him. And Vida's comment on that was, it is often said that women are far too emotional about issues, which I, I will leave that with you. I think that is absolutely lovely because uh, she, she could do that. And then there was the time, of course, when she was um, running a meeting, standing for parliament, and, and this guy up the back said, 
don't you wish you were a man? And her reply was, don't you wish you were? She, she could think on her feet and she had a brilliant sense of humour. So that's really what kept it going. Also, it was the fact that she was very good looking and very smart. In both senses, she was beautifully dressed and, you know, very intelligent. So all those factors. And as I've got on to... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go on. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was also... Um, there was humour, there was brains, there was wit, there was her appearance, but there was also a lot of courage. Oh, yeah. Um, so you, you open with this vignette of 1912, where she's standing on the street corner trying to sell her newspaper and the newspaper for the suffragettes in Britain, and no one's biting. But then she puts on this poster, which says the women are being tortured, the suffragettes are being tortured in England, and she starts selling them like hotcakes. Absolutely. And you yeah. say she's a little bit nervous there, but she shouldn't be because she's used to standing up in front of thousands and thousands of people to, to deliver her, her lectures. That's right. So, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she certainly was. Yeah. And, and, of course, um, in the following couple of years, she stood for Parliament during World War I on a pacifist ticket, and that really challenged her. And that was really standing up and being counted because there were a lot of very angry people who came to listen to her. And in fact, a couple of people set fire to the platforms that she was speaking on. And so she was, she was very, she was very, very bright. She, and, and also she, if she believed it was right, off she went. And yeah. that takes a certain, a certain courage considering what, people threw at her, which was quite a lot, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. She had an uh, internal conviction, but do you think that also came from her background or was that something that she was born with? I'd, say, yeah. was I'd she... say yes to both those things, actually. Her parents were both were very interesting people. Her mother was um, a child of Victoria's Western District, so there was a bit of family money. Her father was a penniless... Irish Jewish, well, shopkeeper really, and they both met in the town of Portland in Victoria in about 1867, I think. Vida was born in 1869. Her mother had a difficult home life, and that's described in the book. There's some very unpleasant things that were happening in her home, and she was desperate to get out. And Jacob, who'd come all the way from Ireland, and was desperate to reinvent himself too. They met because they both had a belief in social justice and practical social justice. And Vida helped her mother very much in her early campaigns, including setting up the first hospital by and for women in Victoria. And so she inherited her conviction, I think from both parents, mm. but she was also... She was the only one in her family who kind of went down that route, actually, went down the um, uh, activist route of her children. So I'd say, yeah, it was innate as well as, um, as, well as being part of her parents, yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a bit more about her relationship with her mother, Isabella? Because the presence of women in her life as role models is also incredibly important in terms of showing her a way forward. That's true, yeah. yeah. Um, Isabella, her mother, was Scottish Presbyterian, as were many people in the in the Western District. And this photograph of her, which unfortunately was taken, it's an obituary, but you can see the strength in her face. I don't think she was ever classically beautiful, but she's got a very strong face and a very strong, probably Scottish Presbyterian sense of right and wrong, which Vida certainly took up. They were very close. Um, mother and daughter. Vida was the eldest and Isabella worried about her all the time and she'd write letters to friends saying, please make sure that my dear Vida is not over overtaxing her strength. I worry about her. So she was, she was a good, you know, she was a good mum as well as everything else and Vida had her as her champion all the way through her career. But there were also, as you said, other women. There was a woman called Annette Bear Crawford, who was a very good organiser and started a thing called the Shilling Fund, which was sort of asking women if they would give a shilling each to help set up uh, the women's uh, hospital. First example of crowdfunding I could find actually. 
And so she was a mentor for Vida. And she also had a couple of really stalwart helpers as well as friends. She was the sort of person, I think, who always kept in touch with people she went to school with right, right through. In fact, she did. Um, in fact, when she met the Premier that day, met Sir Thomas Bent, she was actually having her photograph taken as an old member of PLC with her class. So, yeah, she was um, someone who very much depended on other women, the friendship that she, she got of other women. It wasn't universal, of course, it never is. But the women who were her friends stayed her friends all the way through, and she lived till the age of 80. So, yeah. Yeah. To another aspect of the character that you doesn't you kind of work it out through inference rather than it being there at the fore, like the uh, the capacity for friendship. I think. I think but so. Also, she was an international superstar. She, she was. was. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like everything that happens quite often in Australia. I mean, people make it big overseas, and they come home, and people kind of go, "Oh, really?" But in fact, she was invited to the U.S in 1903 because she was invited as a representative of Australia, quote, where women vote. And she was known as Little Australia. And this, I, I love this. She was known as the light bringer from the Southern Cross, which I think is so sweet. But she went over to talk to the, suffrag the suffragist people in, um, in New York, in fact, right across the US. And she gave speeches and she met all the, all the famous people, Susan B. Anthony, all the people who had been trying to get the vote for US women. And so she came back. She met President Theodore Roosevelt. I think the uh, members of the um, suffragette movement impressed her more than he did. But because uh, he was being very bluff and American and, and sort of a bit sort of hearty. So I think she thought, mm. and then she went over to England in 1911 to help the suffragettes who were the English mob, the Pankhursts and their cohorts to uh, get the vote. She spoke at the Royal Albert Hall in front of an audience of about 10,000. This is in the days before microphones. Yeah. And um, she, her message was always the same. It was a message of equality for women. She was not... Um, a feminist separatist, particularly. She didn't sort of think that women were angels. But her message was giving women the vote. If people ask, what difference has it made to give women the vote? Her answer is, that's not the question. That is not the question you should be asking. Giving a vote to the citizens of a country is a recognition and a badge of equal citizenship. This is to show that women are equal to men as citizens. Yeah. And that was the message that she always um, gave. And the other thing was that women had to be in parliament because men didn't have a clue of things that were different and, and useful for women, what women and children needed to know about. And the, um, the job of women was to educate men about the concerns of women and children. Yeah, so, I thought that was, yeah. that was striking. Um, it seems like a no-brainer now. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> so that was one of the really interesting things about the book. It's like, well, there was an origin for these, um, mm. these policies. And the thing that really interested me was when they set up the Hospital for Women, the Victorian Women's Medical Society, mm. and they got flooded with women patients because they didn't want to go and talk to male doctors. So That's right. And male doctors, yeah. 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 Male doctors didn't want to go and talk to them particularly either. But, um, but the, honestly, that story about women in medicine is enraging because yeah. you had women who were first able, the first bunch of graduates from the University of Melbourne, who were able to become doctors. It was fine for women to be nurses, but women doctors was just a bit too far because, of course, they would have positions of authority. And this was not allowed. And it really, and, and you had women who'd come top of their year and they couldn't get a residency in Royal Melbourne Hospital. And they found a reason for not to, you know, it's just, it's absolutely mind snapping now. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you were writing the book, um, were you learning this stuff as well? Did you have much of a sense of feminist history 
before you came to the book? I knew bits. I knew bits. But, you know, when you put it all together, you do get into a state of low-level crossness, <laughs> which I have to say I was in for most of the book. My poor partner, um, he was sort of there, and every now and again I'd come storming out of this room and say, do you realise that women were not able to do X before? And he'd say, uh, <clears throat> no. Well, they weren't. And I'd go back and do some more work on it. But, um, but yes, um, I lost some of it I did know. Some of the, I knew the bits about um, uh, medicine, but I hadn't realised what a consistent, um, well, I suppose you could call it cabal, what a cons how consistently men banded together for years and years and years and years to keep women out of out of things and the other thing i didn't realize and this is really quite interesting is when you think about what it meant for women to demand the right to vote this was only they only did this about 15 years after the repeal of the married women's property act now the married women's property act was enacted and it meant that women were legally the property of their husbands and everything they owned was also. So that had been repealed by the time Vida was on the scene. But you know, these things take a while to kind of percolate through. So the idea of women as equals was a very new and enraging one to quite a lot of men. I hadn't realized the extent to which that was true, but it was. Yeah, you can also see the um, the opposition, like as you mentioned earlier, about her um, her views on peace during World oh. War One, and yeah. I found that the most interest well one of the most interesting yeah. parts. Of the did book. I. Was yeah. the, the slaughter, and then there was this line I wrote it down. So Archbishop Daniel Maddox is there telling women to breed to raise the population because the men had been killed, and she says women are not going to be made breeding machines for the god of war. For women will ever increasingly refuse to give life that man may take it. But there was huge opposition to that position. So again, um, really eye-opening, the gendered aspect of the home front, pretty much. Yeah. That's that's true. And I often wonder when that particular one too, uh, that particular aspect of it, I often wonder whether that one, that particular one has really died the death because mm -hmm. um you know, women are always encouraged, and not just in this society, they're always encouraged at times of war to to have kids. And it's exactly for that, that's exactly Vida's opposition was exactly as you've said. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So she must have been very brave, like we've Absolutely. already talked about that, um, to um, stand her ground. And people, and towards the end of the war, people were coming around to her point of view because of the massive debt, number of deaths. So, Also, there was a conscription um, plebiscites. There were two of them. Yeah. There was one in 1916 and 1917 where Billy Hughes, the Prime Minister, wanted to get an Australia-wide vote for young men to be sent overseas to fight. And he put it up to the population and quite a lot of people, the press was in favour of it. Mm -hmm. Quite a few people were in favour of, of that because, you know, we needed to help our mother country, Britain, in her hour of need, even though young men were being slaughtered, you know, thousands every day on the Western Front. And in fact, Vida stood up very strongly against that in both of those plebiscites. Mm -hmm. And there is some evidence that the women's vote actually made the difference. Both were narrowly defeated, so, so Billy Hughes lost. But I think Vida had quite had a bit of a subliminal influence in that because a, a lot of women, a lot of women supported her, but quite a lot didn't. You know, there was the time when they were sending white feathers to men for cowardice, saying that they were cowards for not fighting. So, yeah. It was. She felt vindicated at the end of um, at the end of 1917. The interesting thing, though, is of course that this was the fifth time she'd stood for Parliament in 1917, and she lost her deposit. She didn't get anywhere near getting in, even though more people than not supported her position. 
on um, on the plebiscite. So you know, go figure. Yeah. yeah. And I was thinking about those five times that she ran for election. Um, and I was wondering about the research that you needed to do to work out her uh, mental state at the time, because you mentioned there's some speculation, but you do mention her having a diary. And I was wondering, what did she put in the diary? Was it a personal account or was it a public document? Or uh, No, I think it was a personal, it was a personal account. She kept diaries a few times, but she did most of her work was public because she belonged to that genera and even her diary doesn't um there's not very much emotional content in her diary she's she describes with great interest and fun actually her trip to america and also her fight for the to get women's suffrage for victoria in 1908 but there's no there's very very little about her her personal feelings in letters there's a bit more where she's yeah. sort of tearing her hair out about women not being as proactive as she thought they ought to be. But that's about it. She doesn't talk about some of the traumas of her own life, for example, when her mother died, when her father died, um, and how she felt when she, the first time she didn't get in and she got about 51,000 votes. Mm -hmm. She described it as virtually a victory, which in a way, was fair enough because she was she'd put a hand up she wasn't the only woman who stood in that election by the way but she put her hand up because she wanted to test the water and she wanted to educate women about the vote so i don't think she was desperately downhearted about that but don't forget also that she belonged to a generation where you didn't write your uttermost feelings down in print because it wasn't you know they might fall into the wrong hands or or you didn't um you know, you, you kept, she kept most of her writing public and most of it was, um, well, there's quite a lot of light and shade in it, but it's not, it's not a personal diary as we understand it, no. Okay. So how did you go about doing your research and putting it all together? Because there was a lot of material. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really a fact book. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually... <laughs> Um, one of the really helpful things that got me started was the pre, obviously the previous biography by um, Jeanette Bomford, which is still around. It's um, it's in academic libraries mostly, which which I found deeply mysterious because I had I couldn't get it off you know things like Book Depository or whatever. Um, they didn't have it, it was, but it's all in all the university libraries. Okay, so that was the first that was started me off knowing what questions I wanted to ask. Mm. The other two thing, other two or three things, Vida's papers are all stored in the London School of Economics Women's, Women's Library, which is of course in, in London. And I thought, mm, do I need to go over? And I thought, oh, look, it's gonna take a week to get. So I thought, mm. I did happen to know someone who worked as a researcher. It was somebody who actually was published by University of Queensland Press, a guy called Tom Roberts, who wrote a book about Keith Murdoch, a biography of Keith Murdoch, which we worked together on. And Tom was in London. I said, can you help? Dropbox. He photographed every page of her things and sent the whole lot to me on Dropbox. So I had the whole archive. You know, it was, look, honestly, I'm never going to say a bad word about the internet ever again. Well, not tonight anyway. But um, the, that was that. The other thing, of course, was Trove, which yeah. some of you may know about, which, yeah, I can see you nodding. I know yeah. you know about Trove. Yeah. <laughs> National Library's digital newspaper archive. And you can spend, I'm sure you've done it too, you spend many happy hours on Drove, on Trove, just finding out stuff and thinking uh, completely irrelevant to what you're looking for. But eventually, but the thing about the, the newspapers of the time, two things I learned. One is that the language that they used in describing things like um, Vida's um, campaign speeches and so forth the language that the journalists use had a lot more to do with shakespeare and the bible than we're used to now they were common currency shakespearean phrases and um you know which which made them sound sort of slightly more pompous than than we're used to but that was the first thing and the second thing was that they always reported 
Vida's speeches, because the, for the first time in particular, she was a novelty. Oh, good heavens, a woman standing for parliament, ho, ho, ho. And they've reported her speeches verbatim. There were columns and columns and columns. And they, uh, quite a lot of them did this. And they were all over, not only in Victoria, but there were some in Queensland and some in Western Australia. They just picked up stories from each other. There were so many local newspapers and some of them had political, some were owned by the Labor Party and some weren't. And so there was a lot more political affiliation stuff. It was a hell of a lot less, more homogeneous than it is now. And that was really, really useful, not just for finding out what she actually said when, but people's attitudes. So that was, yeah. So I'd say that, yeah, it was, it was um, that. And um, also, um, Miles Franklin, knowing sort of, Forage, foraging around in bits and pieces. She was a friend of Miles Franklin, so I could look at her letters and see, you know, that sort of stuff. So there were, there were quite a lot of other issues, but they were the main things, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of pulling it all together and writing it into a, an accessible piece of work, the thing that struck me was the tone that you used. It was quite um, it was humorous as well. You obviously responded to her sense of humour and you put bits of humour throughout. You drew attention to that. Um, and the tone was also similar, a bit similar to your previous biography, the one about Kim. So I was wondering, um, is, was that a conscious decision or do you just use the same voice? What it <laughs> well, let's put it this way. In both books, the voice took a bit of work. <laughs> but I guess, I don't know, maybe it is, you know, you, you never know this stuff, do you? I mean, whether, you, whether it's your natural voice or, or what, but... Yeah, um, and I really thought that I wanted to write a book about Vida as a person, not an example of feminist whatever, which can be a little bit humourless given half a chance. And I thought, no, 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 she had a sense of humour. And I discovered that fairly early in the piece. So I thought, yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to, yeah. as, as well as giving due credit to her considerable achievements, of course. Yep. Yeah, um, and you mentioned at one point that you wished you had a recording, there was a recording of her voice, yeah. and I wish that too, because it comes up over and over again, and you mentioned that she was speaking at the um, Royal Albert um, Hall to 10,000 people without microphones. So I was like, how on earth would you I have, have a theory. I have a theory about that, and I, I have no evidence for this, whatever. But one of the people she went to school with was Nellie Mitchell, Helen Mitchell, who turned into Dame Nellie Melba. It may not be too much of a stretch to think that Nellie Melba gave her voice projection lessons. I rather, I hope she did. <laughs> I rather like to think so anyway. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was striking. Um, and that she kept calm. She didn't, mm. she didn't get angry. With, there was all this abuse going on. But it reminded me too of Julia Gillard. And Julia Gillard comes up a few times. And I listened to her in the book, and I listened to her at the Melbourne Writers' Festival a couple of weeks ago, and her voice is very measured, and it's also low. And the only time she missed a beat was when she was talking about the Murdochs, the Murdoch papers, and what yeah. they, they did to her. So there was a really strong resonance between those two figures. Um, but you've also written about Julia Gillard before, right. and I was wondering if this is a general interest of yours, women in politics. Um, um, yes, it's become one. It's become one. And the Gillard, the Gillard book really, because I met her a few times and I spent time with her yeah. and I did find resonances be, between the time, you know, with the time that she was in politics and Vida. And you're right, that's the calm. It's the absolute ability to be engaged but calm, not to be particularly detached, but to know how that works. I think they're both women who are fortunate in their temperaments, actually. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, yeah that's a, um, a good point. Um, and I was wondering if that also feeds into the subtitle of your book, which is A Woman. Mm, right, Did yeah. you pick that subtitle? Well, that came, that sort of took a bit of getting getting into as well. But I did try, what I've tried to do is not only write, um, a accessible biography of a very interesting Australian woman, but I really found that there were so many parallels between the way Vida was treated and the way Gillard was treated. And really by the press, by 
men mm-hmm. and to some extent also by other women, but in both cases. Um, they both understood the need to make alliances, not just with other women, but with men, and they both did. Um, and they weren't sort of feminist separatists, either of them, because they couldn't afford to be. They both had very good, I think, Gillard has a pretty good strategic brain mm. and Vida did, al- Vida did also. And they're both very good at going for the vital ground. So there were parallels between between them that, that were quite obvious, even apart from getting furious because they were both treated badly. But the thing about that really got me was, you know, we all know about Vida, and, at least uh, about Julia and, you know, those placards, Ditch the Witch and, um, and all that stuff. Vida's version of that mm. was her fear that her opponents would release rats or mice onto mm. platforms where she was speaking. And you can just imagine it. I mean, those long dresses it would not have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but they're also um, the pragmatism comes through as well. So Vida recognised, well, not every woman's going to vote for her. Like, it just wasn't going to happen. And then Gillard was, um, um, and I often think about this in terms of families. Gillard pulled together a lot of disparate people to create policy. And that's what women do in families. Like, they remember the birthdays. They keep the social relationships going. They mm. keep the peace. And they knit everything together. Um, and it seemed like Gillard was doing that in, in Parliament as well. And Vida, you mentioned earlier about her ability to hold on to relationships. Yeah. It's doing a similar... Yeah. similar. You know, it's got friends she went to primary school with, you know, quite, quite obvious. It's, the other thing is too, which brings up another point, that it's the sort of the family, the close-knit family, both families of both um, of Gillard and Vida, both of them had immigrant parents and the thing about immigrant parents is that they stick together immigrant families and the children have to do better the children have to do well and i think vida and um julia gillard both imbibed that lesson actually yeah families yeah yeah Mm. Yeah, that's a good point that's interesting um yeah and you also there's also a sense that we've made huge strides in equality for women but things are still some things are still the same so oh, Vida was talking about equal pay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. years ago. Um, yeah, so, and, and, you, and you mentioned getting really frustrated as you were, you were writing this book. Mm. Yeah. Um, how do you think that, because one, one of the key words, one of the key slogans she used in her campaigns was, um, Australia is a broad country for broad minds or something. Mm. along those lines. Do you think that things have changed that much in that regard? I don't know. It's really hard when you're in the middle of the period that we're in at the moment when there is just so much bad stuff happening. So, yeah. so um, you know, in so many places. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise that Facebook is full of pictures of cute kittens, for example, you know, that... Um, and there's all of that. There is. There are a few bright spots. I mean, one of them, I think, is the fact that I can't imagine 10 years ago that Malala Yousafzai or, um, or Greta Thunberg would have stood up and been counted and have been given the platforms that they have been given, despite all the garbage that's thrown at them, um, to say what they believed as eloquently as both of them have. And yes. I think that is, that's a kind of a, a small bright spot, I think. <laughs> And probably not that small, but really it is a bright spot that that young women now are feeling that they have not only the right to stand up and say what they think, but the tools with which to do it. And I think that really is, that's that's pretty good. But, you know, we're in such a sort of maelstrom of cross currents at the moment, it's really hard to tell. Don't you yeah. Think? yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good point, yeah. Um, and also, um, there was a difference in the way um, the Australian, uh, how Australian women kind of managed to get the votes compared to England, where it was quite a bit more uh, extreme and even violent at times. And I was wondering if that might be to do with class. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, the situation? You mean that? Between, between the two countries. Oh, um, 
Yeah, well, there are a couple of interesting things there. I think partly because we got the vote. Women were given the vote as a kind of, you know, it was a parliamentary, oh, by the way, slightly. It really is written like that. You look at when it was passed and it was, you know, citizens of Australia. Well, women are citizens of Australia. It was he, citizens. And someone pointed out that women were citizens too. But, you know, the he actually means she, which is what they believed at the time. So, you know, um, as I said to somebody, it's sort of as if we got the vote by a convention of English grammar, which is a bit strange. <laughs> but, uh, um, but the other thing was that women in England kind it was much more gradual women with property it was much more class based mm. i think class comes into this a bit mm. and we all thought you know australia new country all this wonderful stuff but it took 40 years for us to get women into parliament and it took the us and the uk about five so once it was there it was there but we had to keep proving it again and again and again, maybe because it came easily by legislative fiat for us. So we didn't think it was a big, a particularly big deal, but it really, really was. Yeah, I was really, um, I was really struck by your descriptions of Adela, I don't know how you pronounce it, the Pankhurst. Oh, Adela, Adela Pankhurst. Oh, I liked her. <laughs> and sent to Australia because she was too extreme. I thought that was fantastic. Oh, her, mother, her mother, Emmeline, sort of said one of Adela is too much. She really didn't like her very much. The other two were... Um, the, the interesting thing about that was that the other two Pankhurst women, the apart from Emmeline herself, there was Christabel and Sylvia. And the thing about those two, they, they were much more their mum's daughter, daughters. But... Um, uh, um, Emmeline decided to stop trying to push for the vote as soon as World War I broke out because she wanted to support Britain. Adela thought, as Vida did, no, you know, yeah. war is a bad thing. And so she campaigned against the war with Vida and another woman, Cecilia John, who was a well-known musician and a pretty good activist. The three of them actually spearheaded quite a lot of that in Victoria. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then um, you mentioned that later on in life, Adela became a right winger. She did. Uh, you know what happened there? <laughs> she did. Right. She went more and more. She, you know, she married a guy called Tom Walsh and they were common members of the, conf uh, um, card carrying members of this Communist Party of Australia. And then they decided that that was all. And they just kept moving right. And I have no yeah. idea how that happens, but it did. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was a wonderful, wonderful description. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just one last question before we open up to the audience at large. Um, why do you think there hasn't been the attention to Vida that there should have been, considering the huge amount of work that she did? She was partly responsible for that. She, um, the one of the accepted things you hear is, oh, well, you know, her job was done, so she stopped. No. I think what happened was that, that 1917, when she, when for the fifth time she was unsuccessful in her bid for Parliament, I think she thought, you know what, I've had enough of this. Mm. And so what she did, she did two things. First of all, she became very interested in international politics and did quite a bit of writing about international politics. Her view was that World War I was not the war to end all wars. It was the beginning of a much greater conflict, which, of course, it, she was right um, 20 years later because she saw, you know, how everything was divided up among the Allies and, you know, trouble would come. So she saw that. And that was the first thing. So she, she wanted to comment on a wider scale. But at the same time, she was a very, very dedicated Christian scientist and she wanted to extend her Christian science practice, which really meant being a counsellor for other people in the Christian Science Church. So she did a lot of work as a practitioner and in Victoria and did a lot of work for the church as well. So she was kind of going inward and outward at the same time. And, at this, and while she was doing that, every now and again, she'd pop up in the press in 1934, which is 14 years, 15 years before she died. She turned up because it was um, 
oh, 36, oh, hang on, 18, 19, oh, sorry, 1934. Yeah, Victoria's um, centenary, um, the centenary of the founding of the state of the, of the colony of Victoria. She stood up there. She sort of made a comment about, you know, where women, what women have done. She was very cross because she didn't think the new generation were nearly activist enough. We've heard that one before. And uh, yeah, so she did turn up every now and again, but she died in 1940, 49. And I was rather sad to see one of her obituaries, which was written by a colleague, got a whole lot of facts wrong about her, which was a bit sad, really. Yeah. Including the fact that the first time she stood for Parliament, she got half a million votes. Take off a naught, you know, it's 51,000. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. 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 So partly yeah. her choice, partly circumstances, I guess. Yeah. Mm. Quite anger. Yeah. Um, so I'll pass over to um, Emma, Kate now, because we have about 10 minutes or so for questions from the audience. Yeah, lovely. Thank you so much, Jess. And thank you, Jacqueline, as well. We've had a couple come through. Um, the first is, um, in your research um, that you conducted, Jacqueline, is there anybody else that you um, would like to write about? Oh, look, yes. Yes, there was. There um, there were several women I would like to I would like to write about. Um, um, some of the women who were Vida's cohorts, and the women who were slightly older than she was, actually. Um, my favourite one is a woman called Britanna Smythe, who was six feet tall and wore blue glasses, and started studying medicine in Melbourne, but had to give it up because she couldn't afford to continue. She ran a green grocer's shop, but her, her thing was contraception. And she imported and sold a lot of contraceptive aids for women. And they could go to her green grocer's shop and buy these things. She advertised in the press, but she was very keen on selling diaphragms because diaphragms were a method of contraception that men needn't even know about. So... Um, and there were several women like her who were just as vocal and just as determined, but didn't get the run that she did. So I think a biography, sort of a joint biography of Vida's predecessors would be really interesting because there were some fabulous women there. I can tell you, there really were great women there. Thanks. Um, we've also been asked if you um, will write a Young Readers edition, please. Is there, um, yeah. Actually, I'd love to, you know. Publisher, please see if this is possible. This would be good. I would really like to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it would be wonderful. Um, similar to um, that note about the women that you would um, like to write about through your research, what was, who was, um, what or who was like one of the most surprising facts that you came across or one of the most shocking facts? Um, Britannia Smythe was pretty interesting. I mean, I didn't realise that um, that contraception. In fact, if you look at the um, the ads for contraception, they were pretty, you know, imported from France. You know, really good good stuff. So the amount, the level of education of women was was high. Well, you know, I was going to say higher than I thought, but really there were more um, avenues for women to know about things. I mean, we don't seem to think that our grandmothers and great grandmothers knew very much about um, women's lives and, you know, the, uh, well, contraception being one thing, but in fact they did, but they only, they didn't have anyone to represent them. It was mostly they'd meet and talk about these things and talk about their discoveries and so forth. But, um, but they were really more vocal and better um, and more opinionated and, you know, than, than, I had, than I had thought because I sort of being a 70s type feminist, I was a bit patronising about all of that. You know, you think, oh, your mother, you know, grandmothers mm, don't know anything. They do. Oh, they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've been asked, how long does it really take to do the research and how do you sift the facts um, from mm. what is incorrect? Yeah. Yeah, that's always a bad question. That's always a difficult question. It's always a very difficult question because you've got to have on your shoulder someone saying says who all the way through, you know, and basically original 
if you can find original sources, they're more likely to be closer to what you think the truth might be. Although there's all that stuff about bias. And um, I think what you have to do is just work out what you said. It sounds so strange, but you, you need to work out how things went and how you think they could have gone and why they didn't and why they did. I mean, I know that sounds a bit incoherent. What do you think about that, Jess? Do you think that that's true when you're sifting facts, when you're researching? It's really difficult to work out what's true and what's not, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think after you've spent enough time with this person, you have a sense of you do. Mm. what they think and their attitudes towards things. And sometimes you can tell when they're lying or constructing something because you know them so well. So I think it's just a case of spending a lot of time with their words. Yeah. Yep, I think so too. And, and that, that is part of it. And also uh, where they're, exactly where, they, where they're coming from. And yeah. that wonderful comment by, I don't know who it was. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Yeah, There's, you've, got to, you've got to do that as well. So, mm, yeah. So I think, I think that's, you, you're kind of flying by, yeah, there's, we all know there's, you know, what is truth, objective truth, what is fact. Um, you're, flying, you're flying on instinct and on knowledge a lot of the time, I think. Mm. Can I ask as well, just because I can see the wonderful cover of your book in the background there, and I wonder, did you have access to many images as well that could help you piece those things together, particularly when it comes to finding out who's friends and family? Yeah, the one on the cover, which I think, by the way, is a fabulous cover. I love it to bits. <laughs> there it is. It's, uh, um, I like it because of the, the different elements in it. But yes, there were quite a few images of, of Vida and her family. There were a few. They all tended to be the same ones though. So, you know, you look on about 14 different, I don't know, websites or books, same 15 pictures. So, um, which is, which is a bit of a, a bit of a, problem to a point but um yeah there were images we knew we knew what she looked like at various stages of her life yeah mm -hmm. um and so for the last question tonight because we are um now having to wrap up for the evening but thank you both so much um a couple of people have asked you Jacqueline what are you working on next um well I haven't sort of formed anything up yet I've got a couple of couple of things that I just I just have to see whether they're going to whether they're going to fly or not so um yeah it's and besides which it took a while to do this I'm going to have a bit of time off just for a bit <laughs> before I embark on the next thing I think that is absolutely fair enough um thank you Jacqueline so much for joining us tonight and Jessica it has been a phenomenal discussion um I if, if neither of you have any final questions or comments, then I will take everybody off mute um, so that they can join me in thanking you both. So yeah, if you're ready, then I'll do that. Right, thanks. Thanks both of you, that was great. Thanks okay. very much. <laughs> okay, I'm taking everybody off now. All right, you're all off mute. Thank you, that was wonderful. Yes. Thank you. Great, Great. 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 Thank you. That was really good. That was, really good. That was wonderful. <laughs> Have a lovely evening, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.